Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, I think we can kick this off. Uh, welcome everyone to another uh, KFAS Hackathon workshop, our second in the series. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to remind you all that we have a few of these workshops uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, we have some amazing speakers, both local and international, and they're covering an amazing array of, of topics, everything from data science, to uh, teaching you some coding with Go for anybody here who's interested in that, uh, and things related to design uh, with Haider here today, and later on with also Frank Tuneski. Uh, so we have, uh, I think, uh, a variety of topics that are both relevant to the hackathon and to, to tech and, and design in general, which is what we hope to focus on. Um, so I, I definitely invite you all to check those out. Don't miss them. If you, if you can't attend, uh, you'll be able to catch them later on KFAS's YouTube channel or record there. Um, so to start off today, I don't want to take up too much of, of the intro. We have uh, here with us Haider Musawi, who I think is probably familiar to most of our attendees here, if you're from Kuwait. Uh, Haider is one of the godfathers of the startup ecosystem, as I like to call him. Uh, he is a computer scientist and computer engineer by uh, background and uh, study and trade, where he teaches today computer, uh, computer science and computing at the Public Authority for Applied and Educational Training. I think I got that right, the whole acronym. Uh, <laughs> uh, but also, Heather is an avid uh, UI UX uh, designer. He is a consultant in that field uh, in his work as the co-founder and CEO of Catalyze. Uh, and as well, he's also a mentor through uh, Sirdab Lab, where he's also the co-founder and CEO, or I think his uh, unofficial title is the Chief Learning and Laughter Officer. Uh, to, to us at Coded and to me personally, Haider is a mentor uh, and a big brother and a friend. Uh, we've learned a ton from him, and I'm hoping you'll be able to, to learn something as well today, and I'm sure you will over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, so that's enough of an intro, I think, and I'll let you, Heather, take a mic, and we'll come back in maybe around 25 minutes to do some Q&A. Uh, last thought before I go to you, Heather, for our audience, uh, you can use the uh, Q&A uh, button at the, at the bottom of the screen. I think it's yeah, right around here. There we go. Uh, to, to ask your questions, and everybody else, you guys can kind of upvote any, any, um, any questions that you, that you like. And inshallah, we'll try to get it to as many questions as we can in the Q&A session. We don't have a session after this one, so maybe we can go a little longer than usual, but not too much because I want to get to my dinner. So, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, Heather, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Hashem. I'm just going to be sharing my uh, slides for this presentation. Okay. Uh, I hope the slides are clear. Uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, joining us uh, during this session. The topic of the session is uh, think inside the box. The common convention or the common advice is to think outside the box in order to be innovative and creative. But I'm going to show how, the, how constraints have a positive power to any project or a goal that we wish to pursue. Sorry. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the participants uh, in their participation of the hackathon. Uh, from personal experience, and I'm sure uh, Hashem can attest to this, usually hackathons and startup weekends are the highlight of all startup events. And uh, there's a lot of benefit to be gained from, from it, even though the experience is uh, short in terms of what you actually achieve, you're building something within a weekend or uh, like a day and a half. Uh, but the intensity of learning, the connections that you make and the inspiration you can come out of it is very high. So I'm really excited for the experience you'll be having because I'm sure it's going to be uh, something worth your while and something that you'll um, uh, fondly remember for the years to come. And the most um, obvious, uh, the most apparent um, feature of a hackathon is the constraint in time. You're given such little time, but what I would like for you to think about 
uh, how the constraint is actually an advantage and not a disadvantage. Uh, the goals of this presentation, I would like to focus on three main things. I want to uh, get you to experience a shift in mindset to see constraints as something great, not something to be afraid of, and not something that holds you back. And I'd also, I'll be giving practical on, uh, advice on how you can manage your time and how you can uh, tackle the problem that you wish to address within the hackathon. And hopefully most of the advice that I give for the hackathon, you'll be able to apply beyond the hackathon. Uh, another thing, throughout the presentation, what I'd like you to do is to think about the questions you'd like me to ask, uh, you'd like to ask me. So uh, just keep an eye out on anything that doesn't make sense so you can ask me about it. Uh, things that you're concerned about, whether uh, about the pres like uh, whether something I covered in the presentation or something that's inspired by the presentation and you want to ask me about and anything you're curious about and would like to uh, know more about it. And I mentioned this from the very beginning because I want you to look out for questions throughout the whole presentation. So like I said, constraints are great. Uh, and I'm sure you've ex experienced this as well, a deadline brings a project to life. I know it has dead in the name, but it actually brings projects uh, to life. How does it do that? Uh, you may have said it yourself, or you've heard other people say, I want to start a business. I want to write a book someday. Uh, and usually that day never happens because we've not set any time constraint. We've, set, we've not set any limit to that uh, goal or that pursuit. And as Napoleon Hill says, a goal is a dream with a deadline. So that constraint alone is what allows you to achieve the goal. The constraint is what makes it possible to achieve that goal. Uh, this is a thought experiment. I'd like you to just be mindful of your way of thinking as I ask you these questions, but also you can try it out in any domain that you're interested in. The first question is, tell me about a problem in the world. If I was to ask you, okay, tell me about any problem in the world. Usually what happens is you, your mind draws a blank because there are so many options, you can't really uh, limit it to something specific. But if I was to tell you, okay, tell me about problems in education. So now it's not something global, it's not an abstract question. I'm asking you about a specific topic. But then if I ask a more specific question, which is, Tell me how teachers can uh, improve their approach to teaching. If you were to think about these individual questions, you'll realize the question or the request that gets you to think most creatively and allows you to get the most ideas is actually the question that's most specific. Even though there's a constraint, it actually allows you to think much clearer and much better in coming up with topics. And you can think about this in any domain. You want to start a business? If you say to yourself, I want to start a business, usually you don't come up with good business ideas. But if you uh, work more specifically within a theme or a industry domain, whatever it may be, the more specific you get, the better ideas you uh, come out with. And I I'm really happy for the hackathon, you do have themes uh, for you to explore, so education, healthcare, and so on. Thinking within these constraints will actually get you to identify more specific problems and more specific solutions. Uh, this is a great question. I love this question so much uh, because it reveals uh, the assumptions that are holding us back. So Peter Thiel, he's a, a billionaire entrepreneur and investor author of uh, uh, Zero to One, he says, how can you achieve your 10-year uh, uh, plan uh, in six months? What does this actually get you to do? What I've noticed is a lot of people, when they set their own goals, uh, what they do is they buy themselves time. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so I'll give you like one specific example. Uh, somebody joined a startup bootcamp, which is a training course that we provide. And she said, uh, I'll, I'm giving myself one year 
to decide what startup I want, uh, what business I want to start. So I told her, what's the difference between a year and 11 months or nine months or three months or one month? The thing is because she was too afraid to make a decision, she gave herself, she extended the amount of time that she gave herself because she wasn't decided, but she can come up with a decision in maybe a month or a week. Uh, so uh, a lot of the timelines that we set for ourselves, uh, how, how long does it take to start a book? How long uh, to write a book? How long does it take to complete an app? All these questions, sometimes we give ourselves too much time when if we think within a, a much narrower constraint, we actually start becoming a lot more creative and uh, we make better use of our time. And uh, this is one of the reasons why New Year's resolutions suck so much. 2020 aside, usually New Year's resolutions are bad because you're giving yourself way too much time. You're giving yourself a whole year. Uh, and usually if you, if you mess up at the very beginning, you either say, I'm gonna resume uh, the year after, uh, or you say, it's okay, I have time uh, to get back on track. But because there's so much time that you're working uh, with, you end up not making the most use of your time. So again, thinking in terms of timelines, stricter timelines can help, uh, help you become more creative and more productive. And there's a law for this. This is called Parkinson's law, which says work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. What does this mean? Uh, suppose you want to write a report and I tell you, you have a week to prepare the report, to complete the report. You will likely take the entire week to complete it. But if I was to tell you the same report, uh, you have four hours to complete it, most likely you'll be able to complete it within the four hours to the same degree of quality. So you're not missing out on anything. What ended up hap happening, because you've given yourself more time, you end up using that time. So productivity is like a gas. It takes up the entire container that it's in. So uh, uh, smaller constraints can actually help you be more productive because you're being more mindful about the time, about how you use your time, and you're st setting for yourself very specific targets and a scope for the work that you're going to do, okay? And uh, this is uh, uh, another great um, uh, principle. Uh, if you're interested, I would highly recommend reading into Stoic philosophy. It's uh, amazing, very useful. And this is one of the principles that come from Stoic teachings, which is the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. So sometimes when you say there's an obstacle in my way, I can't, I can't achieve my goal because of X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z are actually the stepping stones that you can use to achieve the goal that you want. They help you solidify. They help you focus on exact actions that you need to take to make progress. Without these obstacles, you may have so many options that you don't know which direction to go. So the obstacle is the way, and there's a book called The Obstacle is the Way, highly recommended. So uh, when it comes to design, uh, and uh, my area of expertise, like Hashem said, is user experience design. I'll, ex I'll elaborate on this a bit more uh, in the following uh, slides, but it's very important to not think of design as separate from other considerations. And the two main considerations beyond the design itself are business and development considerations. I've made the mistake on design projects. I've done uh, designs for clients and uh, we went for something that's so idealistic that when it came to actually getting it implemented, the timeline was very long and the costs were extremely high. So, Quality is one consideration, and usually uh, designers love to think about quality and they want to enhance the quality as much as possible. But there are also other considerations for you um, to take into account uh, when it comes to designing the product. So you say, okay, uh, I want to build a product, but what kind of uh, time constraints am I working on? What is the budget that I'm working within? 
these constraints you need to take into account within the design process. And uh, uh, considering the fact that within the hackathon, your time, the time you're given is quite limited, you need to think within uh, that primary constraint. Uh, constraints also help you prioritize. So if you have all the time in the world, uh, maybe you think about 20 features uh, that you can develop all at once. But if you think of it specifically, you only have the time to work on a single feature, what feature would that be? So uh, you're not treating all the 20 features uh, equally. You have to think about what's most important. And this is really useful. Uh, uh, it's really useful in uh, completing projects, but also in completing projects in a way that helps your target users. And we're going to talk about target users in a bit. But this prioritization is extremely important. So you want to think of, OK, what's the most important thing? What's the next most important? What's the most important thing after that? So in that way, you've sequenced the steps you're going to take without feeling scattered by assuming that everything has the same uh, order of priority. So uh, what kind of criteria do we use? We actually look to our target users, the people we want to use the application, the product, the website, whatever it is we're building, it's uh, catering for the needs of some people, okay? Uh, so who are these people? And there are four considerations to keep in mind. Do they know what you do or what the product does? So it's important, and I'm going to elaborate on each of these points, but it's important for the users to know what your product is. And I'm sure you've experienced this before. You go to uh, an app or a website, and there's no explanation of what it means. So you end up, uh, the problem is you end up uh, confused and uh, not using the app because you don't know what it does or you feel bad about yourself because you assume there's something wrong with you as a user because you weren't able to figure out what the app does. Uh, with user experience design, what we try to do is identify uh, uh, potentially negative emotions that the user might be experiencing, frustration, confusion, anxiety, intimidation, whatever negative emotions they might be experiencing, and you want to move them from that state towards a state of positive uh, emotions. So you don't want to contribute, you don't want to add to the confusion and frustration people are already experiencing. So understanding is extremely important. Do they care about the product? What do they care about the most? We talked about priority, so that's uh, another thing to take into account. And does the product that you're building actually work? Does it solve the problem you intend to solve? Let's look at each one in turn. Um, there's a really interesting study uh, that was done. Uh, what happened was they brought in two children to a room and there was a set of drawers in front of these uh, two children. Then they took out uh, one of the children from the room and they placed a toy in one of the drawers. So the child that was in the room was able to see where the uh, toy was placed, which drawer the toy was placed. Then they brought in the other child who didn't see where the toy uh, was, uh, in which drawer they put the toy. And they asked him, where do you think the toy is? So uh, naturally, uh, he, he started guessing. So he said, maybe this drawer, maybe that drawer. And the other child got frustrated. Why? Because he assumed that the, uh, the child that was out of the room would know what he knows. So this is called the curse of knowledge. Uh, and it's very, very prominent. It's extremely widespread. Uh, experts tend not to realize how much their audience doesn't know uh, about what they know. So they, they, they assume their audience knows more than what they truly know. And if you're working on a product, you may develop this curse of knowledge. You assume people know what you're building when they don't know. So two questions to ask yourself. Do users know what your app is for? Okay, what purpose does it serve? And do they know how to use it? Just because you've been tinkering with the product doesn't mean if you were to hand it to someone else, they'd be able to figure out how to use it. So it's important to, to understand this. 
to recognize the gap between what you know and what other people know. And the app in terms of design should help bridge that gap. It communicates, clearly communicates what the app is for and clearly communicates how it's going to be used. Uh, the other thing, is, uh, when it comes to uh, caring about the product that you've uh, you've built, uh, there's a principle in marketing called seek the seekers. So the person who's identified a problem and is now looking is seeking a solution is your ideal uh, your ideal customer. If you don't pursue that person, if you have in mind uh, the idea of trying to convince people that they have a problem, which they don't recognize, they don't see it as a problem, you, uh, the challenge becomes much bigger because uh, you need to convince them they have a problem before you actually sell them the solution. The easiest thing you can do is to target people who already know that they have a problem that they're seeking a solution for. So do people care about the problem you're solving? Do others value what you value? Uh, sometimes you get attached to the kind of product that you built, the solution uh, that you're providing, but that doesn't mean that other people will value it in the same way. Sometimes there's, a, um, there's miscommunication. So maybe you're focusing on the solution and you've not communicated the problem, or maybe you're using different terminology so people don't relate, uh, they're not able to relate to the kind of terminology that you're using. Uh, but it's, it's very important to recognize what does the target audience actually value, not what you value. Who should be your target audience? Uh, so uh, again, you have a, a choice in deciding the kind of uh, users you want to seek, you want to serve. So uh, maybe there's a, um, a sector within society that's not interested, you don't need to convince them that the product is useful for them. Even if it is, you don't have to convince them. Target the people who are, who are already interested. And then maybe when they start using it and they start spreading the word about the benefits of the product, they'll be able to bring in the, the others that weren't uh, that enthusiastic about the product itself. But the target should be people who are interested in what you have to build. Uh, are they actively looking for uh, solutions? And what are they searching for? Um, think in terms of the words people use to themselves in order to identify the problem, how they communicate what the problem is and what solution they're seeking. What are they saying to themselves? What are they saying to others about the problems they're facing? And do they believe the solution works? A lot of people have given up on seeking a solution because they assume this is how it is. This is what life is like. And I think uh, Uber was able to challenge this because let's say uh, I lived in London where there's uh, buses and the underground and also there are taxis. And uh, the understanding that I grew up with is if you want a taxi, you have to go to certain locations like hotspots uh, hot spots for taxis. But then Uber uh, dispelled that assumption. So maybe I was uh, like, I grew up assuming that there wasn't an alternative to this, uh, but there actually is an alternative. And if you're building something that's disruptive, it's uh, not the norm. You actually have to uh, identify the objections that people have or the cynicism, like they don't believe the, the uh, problem can be solved, although they do want a solution for it. You have to convince them, at least your solution works. Not that they have a problem, they know they have the problem, but your solution actually works in helping them solve the problem that they have. Uh, what, uh, what your users want. So uh, is it the problem they care about the most? This is talking about prioritization. Is it, are you trying to solve a problem that your users care about the most? Because if it's not the most pressing problem, especially within the domain that you're seeking, so healthcare, education, whatever it may be, you don't want your users to be distracted by the idea of this is nice, but what I'm really after is something else, okay? So you really need to understand the domain itself uh, and identify what are the biggest concerns, 
problems, issues people face within that domain. Okay, so what's uh, most important? Another really useful consideration is what's most frequently used. So something that people do on an ongoing basis, on a daily basis, or maybe uh, a few times a day, if you are able to find the solution for that, uh, and you are able to optimize it, improve on it in some way, uh, you're actually gonna, the impact of the solution is gonna be much bigger than something that's rarely used. Uh, and I'll give an example of uh, an accounting application. Uh, it was meant to be used once a month and users forgot about it, forgot about using it. But if you notice social media apps, we use them maybe throughout the whole day. So if you were to make optimizations on things people do frequently, uh, uh, multiple times a day, maybe that's something that you can solve a problem for that rather than something that uh, that doesn't take much time or it's not common, uh, it's not regularly done. Uh, there's a very um, common or popular term within the startup world, which is product market fit. But there's also another consideration we need to have, which is problem solution fit. You, you may identify a problem a lot of people care about, which means there's a market for it, but the solution that you provide does not um, solve the intended, the uh, the problem you intended to solve and provide the uh, results that people are seeking, okay? So it's important uh, while exploring the solutions, the possible solutions for you to consider, would this actually work or not? And you have to validate not just the demand, not just that people care about what you're building, but they actually believe or before they believe that it actually works. You know that it works. So it becomes much more convincing. You feel much more comfortable uh, and much more outgoing in promoting the product because you know it works. Uh, there's a, an approach to marketing or uh, selling. It's called objections-based selling. What that means is uh, um, your intended uh, users, your intended to your target customers may have objections about using the product that you want that you're selling. Uh, let's say it's uh, like a device that you have to pinch your uh, finger with. There might be a fear associated with that. Like, um, is it gonna, uh, like, um, is it gonna hurt? Is it, does it, uh, might it cause uh, allergies? Whatever it may be. Uh, you, ha you have to identify what are the possible objections. And uh, this is really important when it comes to uh, change management. And uh, from what I understood is that the hackathon uh, the participants will, uh, might be working with government entities. Uh, so it's really important to know what kind of objections might uh, government employees experience as a result of interacting with that product. Identify the possible objections and then address them uh, upfront. From the very beginning, address uh, these uh, objections that they might uh, have. Uh, don't seek in uh, innovation for the sake of innovation. A lot of people complicate uh, innovation. They assume that it needs to be high tech. Uh, it needs, uh, like, uh, it needs to be something that we're not familiar with, we've not seen before. But innovation is just a solution that works, uh, and the better it works, the better the innovation. Uh, so, uh, it could be something that we already use, but it actually serves uh, the problem uh, a lot better. Uh, I'll give you a personal ex uh, example. Uh, I was having a mentorship session with a user experience designer. He, he's a well-known user experience designer. And I was seeking his advice about a product that I was building for task management. So I had a one hour discussion with him about the functionality of the app that I was uh, building. And then I asked him, by the way, what app do you currently use? So he said, I don't use an app, I use Post-it notes. So the, the innovative solution that he came up with is something that is so mundane, like you find it in most offices, uh, but he found that this is the best solution to his productivity challenges. And he's a best-selling author. Uh, he's done a lot of, he, he's very productive, but the solution that fits him best was something that's uh, analog and not uh, 
high tech. Uh, and uh, it's very important to avoid what's, what are known as castles in the sky, something that's so idealistic that it can't be implemented. What you want is innovation uh, that, that can be, uh, that, that you can actually encourage adop adoption of, okay? Uh, and it is kind of challenging to know what's a castle in the sky and what isn't. Uh, and to give a perfect example of this is Elon Musk. Everything that he sets out to achieve, we think this is too ridiculous. Like stop right now, you, uh, you don't need to pursue it. But he ends up proving the experts wrong. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a bit, but it's also important for you in, pro in providing a solution to make sure that you address not only that it's a solution that works, but also a solution that you can encourage the adoption of. It, it's practical enough for it to spread in terms of in terms of usage. So just to recap this uh, section of the presentation, uh, be clear about what users know, what they uh, care about, what matters most to them, and what works. Uh, okay, make sure that the solution works. Uh, I'm going to uh, propose three steps that you can use within the hackathon. And the same three steps you can actually use beyond the hackathon for any uh, project that you wish to pursue. So, so step one, survey the space, the domain that you want to propose a solution within. There might be problems you've not considered. There might be existing solutions you've not thought of. Uh, you don't want to propose something or to wor work on a problem that's too small within that domain, or it's not something, uh, it's not the best opportunity to pursue. So in design, we actually have two, two phases, something called divergent thinking, which is brainstorming and coming up with uh, the most ideas that you can come up with. And then once you feel like you've um, surveyed the space enough, you have a lot of good ideas, then you go into convergent thinking, which is deciding <clears throat> which um, problem that you actually want to address. It's very important you give your si yourself some time for the brainstorming. It doesn't have to be a long time, but if you don't give yourself that space, whatever solution you uh, work on, you might end up doubting yourself and doubting the choice that you made. So it's very important to give yourself that time to better understand the domain uh, first. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'd like to get to the uh, question and answer se segment. Uh, but again, the, the important thing is you want to explore as many problems and solutions as possible and also poke at the problems and the solutions. So what's, what are the problems? What's really the problem? And then what are the available solutions? What are the problems within the solutions? You want to get a better understanding of, it, of that space before deciding what uh, problem and what problem you want to tackle and solution you want to build. Uh, so I'm proposing just enough research. Uh, there's an approach uh, to uh, cooking. Uh, I watch Master Chef a lot, and uh, a lot of the chefs they get into a frenzy, like they start panicking from the very beginning. Expert chefs spend a lot of time just setting up their space so that when they start working, everything is, is in place. They know um, where everything is and they can work as productively as they can uh, be. So uh, spend just that en enough space, enough research to get a sense of what you're going to do, what's the plan, so that when you start executing, you feel comfortable enough with the workflow, with what you already know and what you're building. And I think, by the way, the hackathon, you will be assisted in terms of focusing on specific features, which is great. This is the kind of sequencing that you want to uh, focus on. Uh, a quote from Abraham Lincoln, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four uh, hours uh, for sharpening the ax. Uh, don't spend four hours um, in research. I think one hour of brainstorming can be enough, um, but the idea is sometimes you need to prepare yourself to act, to act to work at your best. Okay, so give yourself that space to be ready to work as efficiently as uh, as you can. Uh, 
uh, yeah, and you want to feel comfortable with the problem and the solution that you've settled on. Step two, scaffold the solution. Uh, again, there's a, a very prominent misconception about creativity that you have to build everything from scratch. Convention, things that have already been used can be extremely useful because it's familiar to people. They already know how, how it's going to be used. There is, there are, there's no steep learning curve. Uh, so let's say you, you build an app with a very similar layout to Instagram, for example, that can work better than trying to redesign what the layout is going to be. Uh, it's beneficial to stick to the convention. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel unless your intention is to reinvent the wheel. Um, that's the only exception, I think. Uh, use existing design patterns and templates. Again, something that people are familiar with, just go with that. And nobody really starts from scratch. So don't question every decision that you need to make. Uh, build on what other people have already built and uh, you can make use of. Uh, cycles of completion. Uh, I think, again, this is uh, going to be addressed within the hackathon, but it's uh, something like a very important point to keep in mind. You don't want to uh, build multiple uh, features, uh, to like uh, several features that are incomplete. And then uh, by the end, when you have to submit something, uh, you say, well, what we wanted to do, what we could have done, uh, things like that. You actually want to complete feature by feature, complete a feature, and then uh, move on. So that at any point, like if somebody, if uh, uh, middle of uh, Saturday, you're told, okay, you can't work uh, anymore, you have a deliverable. So this is an extremely important approach to take because at each stage, there is a solution to be used. Uh, and this is something that's used within the startup world. I'm sure coded alumni already know this, but there's something called agile development and you work in sprints. Um, a startup is a marathon, but you don't want to make it feel like a marathon. You want to have these containments, constraints, uh, typically two weeks, but uh, within a, a hackathon, like uh, an hour and hour and uh, an hour and a half, uh, just for you to complete the functionality and then move on to the next uh, sprint. Uh, bad constraints, I don't want to get into yeah, too much uh, in, into this, but uh, there are certain bad constraints. I'm not, I'm not, um, uh, I don't want to romant romanticize constraints in the same way some people say, oh, failure is great, making mistakes is wonderful. You shouldn't aim to fail or you shouldn't aim to make mistakes. But when they do happen, it's, it's better for you to try and fail rather than uh, be intimidated by, by failure. The same with constraints. There, there are certain constraints that are bad. So false urgency, when you live in constant panic, uh, something's going to uh, like get messed up. Uh, we need to finish this within an hour when you don't really need to finish this in an hour. We need to work weekends when you don't really need to work weekends. Don't give yourself too much urgency, the sense of urgency. Uh, otherwise you'll experience early burnout. Um, wrong assumptions. So sometimes you need to question your assumptions about what's possible, what can be done and what can't be done. Self-doubt. Um, I can talk about self-doubt like a, uh, just a complete presentation about it, but uh, the ceiling of what you're able to achieve is actually much higher than what you think you can achieve. Um, again, I can't get into this right now, but it's important for us to talk about this because a lot of people hold themselves back. It's not, it's not their capabilities, it's their level of confidence. Uh, that, there's a saying by Abraham Maslow, uh, uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Some people, because they have expertise in a certain domain or they love technology, they try to find a technological solution to any problem that they face. Sometimes you may need to consider uh, the constraint that doesn't uh, exist within your area of expertise. The solution might come from a, a different domain. The solution might be different to what you had in mind. Expertise, uh, usually, Experts are experts of the past, of what worked and what didn't in the past. Usually experts 
are not experts of what's possible in the future. Keep that in mind and don't let other people's expertise hold you back. And I believe that's it. Uh, thank you very much. This is the, uh, so we'll, we can begin the Q&A session. Okay, the first question I see is, do we get a copy of this uh, PowerPoint? I can definitely share it with uh, Hashem. Okay, uh, so let me look at the um, questions. I just realized I was I was speaking, Heather, and I was on mute, and I asked if, uh, okay. <laughs> I was, that was a good discussion myself. So yeah, uh, thank you for uh, offering to share the PPT. We'll, uh, we'll share it accordingly in the uh, Discord channel with the Hackathon participants. Uh, I think just to kind of uh, uh, go back to a question that I think might be relevant to the hackathon, head if we may start with it before okay. we take audience questions. Um, okay. Uh, I, I think the, you mentioned the research part and trying to kind of brainstorm, quote unquote, to use that word uh, in the slide. Uh, in the yeah. hackathon itself, as is, you know, Emma with, with, the, with a real startup. You only have so much bandwidth. Uh, so I'm assuming some of the hackathon teams will be around three or four uh, members, uh, which means that you, they're going to have a choice between either splitting up the team and tackling uh, two problems at the same time uh, or working together on one problem at a time. In terms of productivity, in terms of the laws of diminishing returns when it comes to how many people are enough people to work on a problem, as well as the creative process, uh, are four or three people too many chefs in that kitchen? Is it better to divide up in terms of just getting things done faster? Uh, so in terms of a design approach and a productivity approach, what would be your take on that? Uh, I think it's important to um, get the sentiment of the team that you're working, uh, on, uh, working with because you don't want to impose something that people aren't comfortable with. Uh, but... I would recommend it. It may feel counterproductive or, or uh, counterintuitive, but spending, let's say, half an hour or an, an hour as a team discussing the possibilities, discussing the options, uh, they'll uh, be able to leave that session with uh, like a shared understanding of what's available, what were the options, and what did we decide on. They will feel a lot more comfortable with the choice made rather than having a few people. Um, make the decision or for them as a team rush into the solution without actually better understanding the problem itself and the available uh, solutions. Should the coders, and this is again for the hackathon and let's say life, should the coders get involved in the uh, design process? Because we are requiring that every team has at least one designer. So should uh, should the coders be involved in that or should we be like, look, designer, you're here, this is your job, go get the designer, we'll work on the back end or whatever in the meantime. Uh, um, I think it um, uh, depends on the developer. If the, the coder feels comfortable with being assigned certain functionality and they don't want to have a say in the product, give them what they want. Uh, this is, mm. you, you are working at their very best, like you're, you're getting the best out of them. If you're expecting them, or if you're forcing them to make um, product decisions that they, they don't feel comfortable with, uh, I think it's going to be wasted effort. Okay, uh, so there's a question here, and I think uh, this is a great question because it also touches on something in the hackathon. I can give everybody here a hint. Uh, the question is, up to what extent does the design of the app or the program matter, given that the functionality of the app or the product is solving the problem anyway. And, and the reason I'd like to answer this question specifically is because, and this is a hint to people who tuned in with us, uh, one of the judging criteria will have to do something with, I'm not gonna say what it is exactly, but it will have to do something with user experience. Uh, so it's not necessarily whether the app look, looks good or not, although I think that will appeal to the judges in one way or another, but should we care about functionality during this hackathon or generally speaking, or does UX UI come first? Uh, so uh, what I understood from the question uh, is um, the de design of the application, if there's something that already exists as a template to use, like should you make enhancements um, uh, on, on the design itself? Uh, my recommendation, like I've seen, I've had people approach me for design work and I would turn them down because they want to do an e-commerce platform uh, 
and the real value is in the product that they're selling, not in the e-commerce itself. Like they're selling you a product and that's the most uh, useful thing that you're getting from them. So I, I would tell them, you don't need my uh, help. Go for Shopify, go for Zida. Like there are so many pl platforms you can use for e-commerce because that's not um, like the distinguishing part. But what I would say, it's very, uh, it's a common problem in solutions that already exist, not to take into account what the user knows about the product and how to guide them through that experience. So there might be need for a layer of explanation to guide people through the process of using the application. Uh, I think the question might also have uh, something to do with the fact that should we prioritize functionality over aesthetics when we talk about design in terms of aesthetics? Like how much should we care whether the app looks good or not versus uh, does it do the job or not? Uh, okay. Um, uh, there's a principle in design or the psycho psychology of design. Attractive things work better. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why Moleskin is really popular because if you care about the product, you try you end up using it too well. Um, uh, but I, what I would say is uh, go for good enough rather than uh, it has to be wow. Be especially with the time constraints that you have, it should be presentable. Don't make it feel like uh, it's something that's incomplete. Make it complete, but don't worry too much about like the um, uh, pixel perfection. Okay. Great. Uh, there's a question here from Dalal uh, talking about stress when it comes to maybe the, the deadline. Um, let's call it the deadline paradox that you mentioned, Heather, because I think so on one hand, especially when it comes to design, you kind of want to take your time in the creative process. But I've literally seen people take over a year when it comes to just designing the basic layout of an app. Uh, and then, but, you know, constraining yourself too much and putting yourself under, under a tough deadline that causes duress and stress might be counterproductive. How do, you, how do you find that sweet spot and how do you deal with the stress of a deadline, even if it's reasonable? Because that comes along with the, the, with the, with the package anyway. Yeah, uh, uh, I love the question. Uh, I, the thing to understand about uh, stress, there's a healthy middle, uh, not enough stress, and you don't actually, you don't feel engaged uh, with the project that you're doing. Too much stress, you end up procrastinating and avoiding uh, the project or the task. So you want to aim for um, something in the middle. Uh, the best uh, thing that you can do is you pull back the scope. So uh, especially with a hackathon, uh, if you have so many ideas in mind, just focus on a single feature that if you were to present, will uh, do the job of that feature, okay? Uh, people won't expect uh, much more from the feature itself. And then once you get that done, build on top of that the other feature. Make sure you're managing your uh, stress by reducing the scope and the expectations you have uh, of the project. But uh, again, like you don't want too little stress. You want yeah. something that ma makes you feel engaged. Okay, great. Uh, there's a qu quick question here, uh, a recommendation, a book recommendation that help us think uh, better as programmers or become good things. So you, you're looking at your library, pull, pull something good head up, be out here for us. Uh, I think I gave it away, uh, some of these very good. Uh, there's a, uh, okay. a book, I can't comment about being a good programmer. Uh, uh, there's a book I would recommend for good user experience design, and it's called... Sorry, he, he, the, the question was good thinking as a programmer. So I don't know if that changes your answer, but go on. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, I, I, I think that's um, exactly it. So it is the same thinking, but I don't think it's to do with programming. It's general problem solving and design. Uh, it's called Don't Make Me Think. Uh, and the uh, oh. purpose behind the book is the interface should be, the product you're building should be designed uh, in a way that's simple enough for people to be able to use it without feeling um, uh, like uh, uh, overwhelmed, scattered, lost. You don't need people to think how they should use it. it the product should tell them, should guide them into proper use. Excellent. Uh, uh, would you recommend listening to the book or is it something that you have to kind of see maybe some of the visuals inside it? Uh, I think you'd have to 
see it. Yet. I, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's okay. another book called uh, The Design of Everyday Things. Uh, and I think oh, that yeah. you can listen to. Uh, and that's, that's like... Great. Uh, yeah, it's a great coffee table book, by the way, instead of having some fandom magazine. I, I, I would recommend that one. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Bedr. It's more practical. Uh, yeah, you can read it there. Is there a tool or framework that I'd recommend for building a functioning prototype? Uh, especially if you don't have front-end experience. Uh, and I think this is great for, for small teams in startup world anyway, not just a hackathon where you might be struggling with not having a UI designer, for example. Do you, would you recommend any sort of framework? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, it's something that I want to look into uh, further. Uh, uh, one thing I might suggest looking into is um, the no-code movement. So there's this idea mm -hmm. that there are existing products that you can... Uh, plug together to come up with a basic uh, prototype. But honestly, I don't have experience in that. Well, what we usually use is a sketch and uh, we work in, uh, like, uh, with a development team to actually uh, implement the designs. Uh, I think if you're, uh, if you're comfortable with it, Bootstrap might be a good option. It's not exactly a template, but it gives you kind of preset components. Uh, if, you're, if you're programming in, uh, in React or React Native, there are also some, uh, some preset components out there that are open source. So better if you, if you want to research those, uh, you, you'll, be, you'll be fine. And I think you can maybe get into a team with some of our coded students who are familiar with the things that I just mentioned. So <laughs> that, that might be a good idea. Uh, we have, I think, a, a time for one more question. And I like this question. Uh, how do we develop the imaginary creative skills of UI UX design, uh, especially when you kind of get these requirements, these functionality requirements? How do I turn myself into a UI UX designer mode, if you will? Okay, uh, I, I love this question, but my answer might be not what, what's expected. Uh, first of all, uh, my approach to creativity is the more you understand the problem, the more creative you become. By default, you, uh, as you explore the problem further, the solution begins to present itself. Um, so this is usually my approach. Whenever I'm stuck, I say, let me understand the problem further. The other thing is, um, I, I believe everyone uh, has a sense of design because user experience design is about how users feel. So as a user, you already have that experience. You, you have that intuitive judgment you just don't know the reason for why you feel the way you do, okay? So what I would say is explore your own experiences and what, when, whatever you feel, ask yourself, why am I feeling this? Uh, what can make me feel different or can make me feel better? Sometimes you say, this is annoying because I had to take several steps. So you know the problem is several steps. What's the solution? It helps to have ex experience uh, across a broad uh, a set of uh, applications because whenever you struggle with one thing, sometimes the solution comes from another uh, application. Absolutely. And I think uh, just a quick note here, ever, ever since uh, I got married recently, I've uh, bombarded my wife with, with this whole UX thing. She's sitting right there, so she can hear me. <laughs> it's in uh, day, day, daily things. I'd be like, ah, oh, this, this UX is horrible. Or, you know, this UI is great, but the UX is horrible. Like, they made it look so pretty, uh, but, <laughs> but the UX is insane. And, and I have this puff button right here, and I, and I use this as a great example of good UI and UX. Uh, but yeah, I think to answer that question, you, you, as you said, you can put your shoes, uh, you can put yourself in somebody's shoe, the user's shoe, and, and maybe walk a mile. and can understand uh, what they might feel. Uh, feel free to WhatsApp me anytime. <laughs> Anything. I love people venting my way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Hassan uh, is asking about something that has to do with actually the hackathon itself. Hassan, I, I didn't mean to skip your questions, uh, but inshallah we can answer that question more specifically because it's more of a technical hackathon question. The short answer is you won't have to deploy onto our environment. You can deploy... Uh, on yours and then share it with us through a video call. However, tomorrow there's a session and this is for everyone who's tuned in, who's a hackathon participant. Tomorrow there's a, uh, a big Q&A session between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. We'll share the details of that session uh, on Discord where you can go in and ask any questions. 
and we'll answer them. And feel free to ask that same question on Discord so you can get a more detailed answers from our technical team, inshallah. Uh, the same thing with a question, I believe, from uh, Marian, which had to do with the deliverables of the hackathon. So same thing, feel free to ask it on Discord or during the Q&A session tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. I just wanted to um, just kind of leave you with a question. Or... Oh, yeah, Allah, one more question. One more question. Go ahead. Uh, since we're living in the same circumstances, many teams might come up with the same solution for a problem. How can creativity help in that case? Oh, this is a great question. Yeah. And it's a, yeah, it's a great question. But uh, also, uh, I think what um, uh, a lot of people struggle with the execution. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you're able to, to get a solution out there, you're ahead of the vast majority of people. You'd be surprised by how many people have great ideas, but they never act on them, which is why, uh, like, uh, Hashim, you know this, like when people say, I'm afraid of sharing my idea because somebody might steal mm -hmm. it, we tell them, mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, first of all, if the idea already exists, people can steal it, like from Google. Uh, but uh, most people, you'll realize, most people don't act on the ideas that they have. So don't worry about um, being creative or standing out, execute, release something, and then uh, adjust based on the feedback that uh, you get. Uh, absolutely. And by the way, uh, another hint for you guys, uh, since you're all here at 9 p.m., uh, the, the, there is obviously, I think you would have assumed this, but there is a little bit of, let's say, consideration for whether your ideas have a sense of creativity or innovation. And that's obvious because the challenges we're presenting are new challenges. They, they have existing solutions, it's just they're inadequate solutions. So make sure that whatever you do, you understand first, as Haider said, what are the current solutions and how can you make them better in a more innovative way. Uh, better the sketch tool, uh, I'll, I'll type the answer um, right after this, or I'll, I'll, uh, it's actually, I'll add it to maybe the list. Sorry, it's sketch.com. I just checked the website, yeah. sketch.com. Okay, thank you for saving me a click, Heider. Um, I think we're out of time. Heider, maybe a last uh, word of advice for the hackathon participants, specifically when it comes to the, to the design side, UX or UI, what would you like to, to say to them? Um, uh, first of all, enjoy the experience. Uh, it may be stressful um, like uh, a bit, but there's a lot of joy to be gained from the experience itself. Uh, but uh, as you're going through the uh, building phase, keep the user in mind. Uh, what does the user know? What do they care about? Um, how, what, what are the sequence of steps that they're going through? Great. Thank you so much, Heider. Magasar, thank you for your time. Thank you, audience, for your time as well. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, just feel free to ask them on Discord. We will have some design mentors in the hackathon, so if you're not so good with design, don't worry. We'll, we'll try to help you out there. And uh, hoping to see some amazing products by the end of it that both function well and look good and are seamless for the user. Thanks again, Heider, and thank you, audience. Have a great night. Thank nice you.